So we learned a lot about the theory of surfaces, but now we're going to see a live demonstration, and that's exactly why you've logged on and you're sharing the show. Before we go to that, though, I just want to remind everybody, you're dealing with the internet and the computers, and the cure-all finish to any problem you might have is to refresh, and that might solve your issue. And I'm seeing most people are having no issues, but every once in a while, recommend refresh, and you can solve your problems. All right, we're going to kick it to our live demo. Chris Straub, Hal Fowler outside, going to show us a little bit more. Thank you, Joe. I'm Hal Fowler. I'm uh, part of the Rottler team. I've been in the industry now for uh, 37 years, and we're going to do a little uh, demo here of our S86A with our um, Rottler Quick Level Table. Um, the Quick Level Table makes this job uh, very simple, but uh, we're going to go on and put a head in here and do this little demo and uh, show you how it works. Well, how while you're doing that, how long has Rottler had this quick leveling table? Well, this leveling table uh, has been around for actually uh, a couple of decades now, but we have basically uh, married it to the uh, S85 and 86 series machines. Um, as you can see, we just basically put put the head up in there. We've got our uh, parallels set. Uh, it has some uh, pieces in the back that catch the head to keep it from rising up. And all we've got to do is roll the uh, quick clamp in here. That will uh, lock our cylinder head into position so that it doesn't move. And at that point, we're going to level it. We actually have a couple of different different ways we can do that. Um, the I saw that unique level. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, this uh, generally is the way that we do it. Um, this is our Rottler dual axis level. We also have um, a magnetic indicator okay. that can clamp on to the bottom of the cutter head okay. to sweep back and forth, which sometimes makes it a lot easier okay. if you're especially going to uh, do some angle milling so that you can angle it to a specific amount. Now, are these tools included with the S86 and 85 series, or are they options? Well, these are optional pieces, okay. um, but you, generally people are going to buy the dual axis level. This is an, actually another optional piece to, that you can purchase as well. Okay. But anyway, we'll kind of continue going here. Um, we're going to guide it up in here. The table actually has a couple of handles here. One of them pivots it front to back, and end to end, so that we can get her leveled. Okay. We're uh, got our level up on here, and with the hand with it unlocked over here, you can pivot it, get it set. Got got it all set, and now we're going to uh, move the machine over here <clears throat> near the cylinder head. And we have a touch-off indicator. And this touch-off indicator is actually the point in which the tool bit is going to make contact with the cylinder head. And I brought it down here. Actually, we've got a couple foul to go until we get to that point. And what we're going to do is we're going to fine feed that thing down to our touch-off point, which is zero. So everything's touch screen with this machine? Yes. Uh, we, we have a touch screen, moves it here. All right, we've uh, located our zero. We're going to uh, uh, set our zeros, which you can see here. And then we've got the length of the head, which this particular head is about 23 inches in length. Um, and this will be our starting point. Uh, we've got it programmed to cut a total of three thousandths. Okay. Um, in this particular head, we're gonna take a two thousandths roughing pass and then a one thousandths finishing pass. And that's all programmable into the machine? Absolutely. So are you telling me we could go like a hundred thousandths and program it and it would sit there in multiple passes until? 
Absolutely. You could uh, you could program that thing to take 50,000 off or 100,000 off. It's going to take um, whatever you program it to, say 2,000 per pass, 3,000 per pass. It's going to sit there and make passes, and while you're off doing something else, running so the machine. So you can literally walk away from this machine and while it's doing the work. Absolutely. It's all about uh, uh, production and Auto automate, not populate. Populate. You know, it's, um, that's what we're all about today, is trying to do that. Okay. All right. We've uh, got it leveled, got it all set, and so we're going to look at it. going to make a pass here. All right. We're actually going to make a couple passes. So hold that button down. And I'm going to hit it again. <laughs> Speeds and feeds. Uh, again, programmable into the machine? Absolutely. We can um, make it as fast as slow. Okay. That's pretty darn cool. machine versus some of the other uh, competitive machines out there is that we have a traveling column. Uh, the one, the good thing about having a traveling column is uh, that you don't, it doesn't take up nearly as much room in a shop. Uh, that's, a, that's a big plus today. Uh, there's, and there's nothing hanging off the end for it to run into a block or something like that. And I noticed on this, I mean, this is a heavy piece of equipment. I think it's close to 5,000 pounds. So it's got to be quite rigid with that kind of mass. Absolutely. And, you know, here we go. We've got a silver head all, already done. Um, it is just that easy to take the, take it off, put the next head on. Um, so again, with, with this and that table and the machine, and especially with the option being able to set it and forget it. I mean, the productivity in the shop's up because your guy that might have to be standing next to that older machine with a machine like this, he can go off and be using another piece of equipment and 
and your shop rate is now doubled. Absolutely. You know, and your customer's happy because he's getting his parts quicker. Absolutely. Well, the other the great thing about this fixture and how it works, um, this thing, you could surface anything from the smallest of maybe a single cylinder motorcycle head to it will hold um, a 34 6 e caterpillar which is you know, a, a really large head and with the with the t slots in the table if you can dream it up in a way to clamp something down we can cut it so with as much turbo stuff as we have now, so we're even talking about uh, machining turbo flanges and, and housings and that type of stuff. Absolutely, turbo housings, in, intake manifolds, exhaust manifolds, okay. anything that uh, you can dream up to, to clamp in this thing, hey, we can put a surface on it. And so I guess as far as header flanges and everything else too? <clears throat> Absolutely, not a problem at all. Uh, we have a variety of uh, tool bits uh, for the application, if, uh, for the folks that are out there listening to, to Chuck talking about uh, CBN, PCD, uh, we've got a wide variety of those inserts for whatever the application you might need, uh, whether it be uh, an up sharp, as Chuck mentioned in his part there, uh, uh, to surface a, um, an aluminum head, I mean aluminum block with steel sleeves in it. Uh, we have uh, tool bits for cutting diesel heads. Uh, we even have a special octagon shaped uh, insert for cutting diesel blocks. And all this tooling, of course, I guess is available through Rottler, uh, anything that you need. Absolutely. And I guess when you're, when a shop is looking at this type of piece of equipment, you all, the sales rep will come in and do up a quote based on what you're doing in that shop and quote the tooling and everything exactly. that you need. We're gonna, you know, we've got this machine basically and uh, we have an, an 85 and an 86 and the difference in the two machines uh, is the uh, capacity. Uh, this fixture will fit in either of those machines, but uh, one <clears throat> will uh, accommodate approximately 40 inches and the other one gets a little over 50 inches. So uh, we can pretty much take care of the needs of anything that's out there. So on the and the S86, I guess since it's the larger of the, the two, this is an 86, and this is the larger of the two machines. But if you have them sitting here, they will physically look you know, very similar in size, and don't you know it's only 10 inches difference in space. Okay, but somebody doing a lot of, of diesel stuff, larger type stuff, you're definitely going to want the 86. The 86 is going to be where you're going to go, especially with those uh, larger caterpillars and Detroits and you know, those type things. Okay, all right. And then as far as uh, the, I know they talked a little bit about the cutting type, so the CBN cutter is best for both <laughs> aluminum and? Well, CBN can be used on cast iron or okay. aluminum. Um, CBN is better designed for cutting cast iron. Okay. But it will cut aluminum. PCD is for aluminum and aluminum only. So if you're in that, what we're talking about, like uh, an aluminum block with steel sleeves, you're going to have to go back to CBN. Only thing sometimes is that uh, the aluminum will want to uh, adhere itself to uh, a CBN insert. It'll kind of stick to it and it'll sort of smear it. Uh, but that's sort of the difference between the two tool bits. Okay. What they do. And as far as if somebody was looking at one of these machines and was interested in purchasing one from Rottler, uh, what kind of lead time would they be looking at? A production oh, date? Oh. We're generally in a uh, month, two, two months, something like that. You know, it just depends on the time of year and what we have going on. But, you know, years ago in the shop, what blows me away is you'd have to stand there in front of a machine, a surfacer, and every pass adjusted it and, and go through. Not this is not anymore. That's not that's not the way of the, what we're what we're out here to do. And you're literally telling me everything on this <laughs> is controlled by this touch screen. Everything, and it's very, very simple. There's four buttons to set. Okay. You know, start of the cut, position of the cut, end of the cut. So uh, uh, a machine shop, an established machine shop that may be buying one of these new machines and gets a younger generation in that's interested in doing something, they literally could be trained on this machine and within Couple hours a day, a half a day, to, half a day. Uh, to get somebody up and going uh, very proficiently. The odd.
automation that Rottler has come up with, is, it's, it is simply amazing. It really is. That's uh, obviously what we're here for, is to uh, automate, not populate. You know, let's uh, you know, be as productive as we can. You know, today's world, you know, we need to be able to run two or three machines at one time. Okay. All right. Well, I tell you what, this, is, uh, this has been pretty eye-opening, a piece of equipment like this. Pretty impressive. Thank you. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to be able to show this to you and the rest of the world out there. All right. Well, if you got any questions for uh, us here, uh, be sure if you can log on to the Rottler website and send them an email if you got any questions about the uh, 86 or the 85. And um, stay tuned in. We've got some pretty good stuff coming up. All right. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Alex Bickle. We're here at Creason Racing Engines here in Troy, Missouri. And today the project is we're going to be surfacing the cylinder head, make sure it's flat so it has a good mating surface with the block. All right, so today we're going to be working on the S8M. We're going to be working to get this deck flat so we have a good mating surface between the block and the head. And on a good reference, like on a small black Chevy, we got the exhaust ports that are right next to each other. So it has a lot of heat generated right here. So every once in a while, if the engine gets too hot, then it'll blow a head gasket and it might warp the head a little bit and we have to resurface it. The MLS head gasket will need about a 30 RA finish or lower. And we'll, I can usually get anywhere from like a 10 to a 15 RA finish. With the S8M machine, it's really nice because this fixture right here, we can move these blocks wherever we need real quick and these hook into anywhere basically on the cylinder head with a good edge. Or for me, I use them in the exhaust port right here. Um, I've ran some machines that you really have to hook them inside the exhaust flange over here and you have to hunt and search for bolts and it just takes a real long time to get it set up. I've spent over an hour doing that kind of stuff. And with the S8M surfacer, I can essentially walk over here, move the blocks where I need them, get it all set up and I can have this thing going in like five to 10 minutes. So that's a huge advantage with this machine. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get to surfacing on the S8M surfacer, guys. So first off, when I get started, we're going to need to have these blocks somewhat close to where we want. Good reference point. I usually use the exhaust ports to get these uh, wedges or hooks in there. We're going to go ahead and set it down on the valve cover surface. Go ahead and move these into the exhaust port. Make sure you have a nice flat square surface so that they can hook into. We're going to go ahead and move this adjustment piece here. And we're going to go ahead and move this piece over here. And then once you have everything set in place, I'm gonna go ahead and tighten everything down. When I used to set these heads up in the machine, I would have to bolt this, bolt a fixture on the back side of this exhaust flange here. And I would have to bolt it to a bar. And the biggest issue was just finding all the bolts that you need. Sometimes they just get lost or roll away and whatnot. And then I would have to put the machine shack up under this side to keep tension on it so there wouldn't be any other uh, flexion or anything as a cutter would run across the top of it. So this is great because you have four points at which are underneath the cylinder head and what that does is keeps the fixture really stable with the cylinder head side of it. Doesn't allow hardly any deflection at all.
And then we have this set screw here. We have a lot of adjustment with it if I need to. I can have it broken loose. I can move this wherever I need. So I like to have a good central point where I put the pressure just so it doesn't try to push ahead left or right, especially when it's being surfaced. And I can move this wherever I need it to be moved. So this is gonna be, it's gonna work out for me real good right, right about here, this intake port. So we'll go ahead and tighten this down. And most things on this machine work on a, uh, like a wedging principle, like in the backside on the exhaust ports. And then right here we have like a center point, which helps push down and in and into these wedges on the backside. And that really keeps it nice and tight while it's being surfaced. So we're all good there. I'm gonna go ahead and break this block loose. And we're gonna roll the cylinder head back to where it looks somewhat flat. And then we're gonna make sure that we have the cutter head has an indicator on it. We're gonna make sure that that is gonna run down the center of the cylinder head. So once we get everything tightened down in here, I like to take this gassy scraper here um, Goodson sells this super scraper right here, and it's a carbide tip gas scraper, and it's machine flat. Some people would say probably not to use it because it's a little bit harder than the aluminum, but it's not going to hurt to think you don't put a lot of pressure on it. And what this is going to do, it's going to make sure that we don't have any burst sticking up or anything, so that when I put my level on here, I have a nice flat surface. So I'm just going to go ahead and run down this. You can see right there where it's get rid of any kind of burrs on a nice flat surface. Run my hand across to make sure we have nothing sitting on top. So we have this level right here guys. It is a dual axis level from Rottler and it makes the setup much faster on this. Um, on some of the other surfaces that I've ran we would just use an indicator and once you get everything indicated in it's not bad, but getting to the point where you're somewhat close and being indicated in, it can take quite a while. But with this, you just line the bubbles up into the center of the marks, and it gets you within a couple thousands almost every time I've ever used it. Now I can run an indicator across to my cutter, and I'll know I'm square from there. All right, we're all set. We'll go ahead and lock this down. Go ahead and take my level. I'm just going to set that up here out of the way. Keep it broken. So we have the lock right here for our uh, cutter head. I'm going to go ahead and run this cutter head up. And we're going to go ahead and run this thing over. When I use this indicator, I like to usually use about 10 thousandths of preload. That way when I'm running across it, I can just keep this indicator pushed down and the indicator won't get caught on any of the uh, bolt holes or the combustion chamber or anything like that. Brand new cylinder head and it's actually warped in the center a little bit. And I'm within two thousandths left to right. And while I'm down here, I'm gonna go ahead and set my cutter's range of travel. Alright, we are 8,000 so we are ready to go. Alright, so I like to get the cutter head over the cylinder head here, and I'll actually take the cutter itself, and I will lower the cutter head down until I feel a catch on the deck of the head, and then I'll go ahead and raise it up. And what I'm doing here is just making sure that I have a clean cut front to back. You can just hear that right there, it hit all the way across. And you can actually see on here that it hit from front to back all the way right there. Go ahead and hit my cycle start. I like to stay real close just to make sure that we have no issues here. You can hear that, it's just hitting some birds that's just going to cut along. And like I said, I'm just doing a zero pass on here guys.
when I go ahead and get the S8M set up, like I said, I like to be able to do my zero pass on there. And the reason why is because I, I did sweep across it in three different spots. So it gives me a really good probability of not having any kind of issues or anything like that. But sometimes you can have a bolt hole with a big bird sticking up, people over and things, or uh, around the dial pins especially, people sometimes will beat heads down on the dial pins and it makes a real big burr right there. Now that the SAM has done its first zero pass here, we have the light flashing here to go right. And you want to make sure that you have the light flashing when you want to go right, because if you don't, it will mess up your um, end of cut and you'll have to go back and reset it in the machine. So go ahead, just hit that. It automatically feeds back across by itself, which is another feature that I love about this machine. I don't have to sit there and hold the button down for the go. Go ahead and stop the machine. I'll go ahead and drop my cutter head down a couple thousandths. Just make sure that I am cutting left to right flat and from the back flat. I don't like to take a big cut because you can still have it not set up quite the way that you want. You can hear that cutter cutting. It's a nice sound. Uh, it's not micro welding or anything like that. SAM has just finished its second pass on here with two thousandths and if we take a close look at the deck of the cylinder head we can see that we have a nice finish front to back and we have the cutter is cutting left to right nice too and we can also see like I said this is a brand new cylinder head and it's actually not flat on this back side it's warped a little bit still so we're going to go ahead and My name's Ken Carlson. We're here at Leary's Auto Machine, Groton, Connecticut. Standing in front of our Rottler F68A. We purchased this years and years and years ago, basically uh, for all our block operations. Extremely easy to use. Uh, we do all our block boring, decking. We do a lot of block sleeving, a lot of domestic stuff, a lot of import stuff. It can do line boring also. Um, I believe it's machine number one, serial number one. definitely has sped things up for us. The accuracy is awesome. Uh, the easy use uh, with all the touch screen is, is really easy to use. And like with everything else with Rottler, the, you know, the service, the quality, it, it's always, always been there for us. You know? Today we, got a, we have an LS block in here. We're just gonna do a 
show you one of the quick operations that it can do as far as squ square decking the block. Um, because the blocks are actually, the V8 blocks are actually fixtured um, with the performance fixture lined up with the main, main bore tunnel in with the cam bore tunnel. It actually squares everything up and it's going to true the surface to the main bore. Yeah, so basically one of the operations we're going to show you is, you know, how easy it is just to deck, you know, deck the block, um, square it up. The touch screen system in the, the way the, the numbering is and everything, the, the p different screens you go in and out of are so easy. Once you set your, you know, couple little parameters, you know, it's extremely easy, you know, and basically you just walk up, hit your start cycle, the machine's going to do its thing. Mm -hmm. and now you can walk away and you can actually start working on something else. One of the reasons we got the Rottler F68 is the accuracy of it. Um, the machines we were using before, the older type of equipment, you're using a boring bar that basically mounted on the deck of the block. Uh, cumbersome, real slow, really not the most accurate machines in the world. Um, and when you're done with that, it had to get set up into another machine if you wanted to do the decking again, you know, basically wasting a lot of time. With this machine here, you can do all the operations almost in one, in one setup. So something that was taking you maybe half, three quarters of a day, you can now bore and deck, um, you know, a V8 block in an hour and a half. Typically, to, to be honest with you. So you're saving a ton of time on top of being, you know, a lot more accurate. One of the biggest advantages of this machine over everything we used to have years ago is because it uses locators in the main bore tunnel and also the cam tunnel. It's not only squaring it, you know, front to back, it's also lining it up 90 degrees, you know, to the, to the main tunnel with any kind of performance build, all the race stuff that we do, uh, a lot of drag race, a ton of circle track stuff. Every little thousands here and there is, is horsepower. Uh, so it, it definitely gives us a lot better product in the long run.
Hey everybody, we're back live. Gonna do some more Q&A. We've got Ed Keebler and Joe Kreese and Ed from Rottler. Joe, Kreese and Racing Engines out of Missouri and seeing the demonstration, first of all, that was tremendous. Actually working and doing and building and making. Joe, I know you've got a successful engine shop. Ed, the machine, uh, just endless questions. I invite you folks out there use the chat section we'll take some questions right now if you have anything about the machine its capability what it can do certain circumstances send them in now there's no question that is uh, a bad question as they would say and uh, this is these are the kind of things that you feel on a, a daily basis people trying to upgrade their equipment maybe a little intimidated by the technology but then once they dive in they realize oh my goodness this is making my job easier. Very simple to operate, uh, takes the operator out of the equation, plus the operator can be doing something else in the shop, which is paramount in today's shop. Uh, Joe, you know, has one of these machines and he can kind of tell you that uh, uh, as an owner, he has numerous employees, and, and uh, I've had the privilege of knowing Joe for probably five or six years now and been to his shop many times. He has a pristine, beautiful race shop, and, and Joe can probably tell you a little bit about the, the uh, advantages of, of this machine. Excellent. Well, first of all, Joe, Joe, yes, Joe's Joe. of the World Unite. Yes. This is a secret society. Secret. You guys are not yes. welcome. But, uh, you know, as an engine builder, mm -hmm. It's a passion, but it's also a business. So whenever you can do multiple things at the same time and, and, and focus on things, that's what this machine allows you to do. Exactly, exactly. You have to uh, operate in a profit. I mean, it is a passion, we love it, but uh, you have to make money. And if you can have a man doing three jobs versus just one, it just uh, is, makes more money. I mean, uh, keeps the... Uh, um, Keeps you in the black. You gotta be in the black. So makes makes sense. Yep. All right, we yep. we got a, a Frederick from uh, Norway. Just wants to know what are they spraying on top of the deck before machining. So do you use anything, Joe, we, during your machining operations? We do not. We we do ours dry most of the time. Every once in a while we'll use WD-40 or just some old lubricant. Okay. I, but most of the time dry. Iron always dry. Aluminum every once in a while WD-40. Okay, and that is just to keep it oh, the tool bit from picking up a pip, yeah. picking up a chip, correct, and, and just marking the surface yep. is all yep. that's, that's really all for. Yeah, uh, I have several customers that maybe use. I, I've heard of Pam, <laughs> believe it or not, the <laughs> right. cooking spray, but sure. but but they claim that the Pam because it uh, has a temperature resistance really helps when you're machining. Uh, there's a there's a. Uh, 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 Mater not material, but a, but a liquid out there called Cool Cut that seems to work very well, that comes highly recommended. It's pretty expensive uh, per gallon, but you just use a little bit of it and wipe it on that aluminum surface right before you cut. You don't really spray it on, it's just kind of a wipe on because it's pretty expensive. Interesting, but uh, uh, see, it sounds like a trick of the trade and a personal preference depending on who you're talking to. Exactly. One, Absolutely. One key is keeping the cutter bit sharp. Keep it rotated. Keep it keep rotated. It, keep it into a sharp point, and then yep. you have less chance of it dragging the aluminum across there. Yep. All right, next question from Alex. Alex, thank you very much for your question. What about machining for a top hat liner? Does it auto tool change is the question. Uh, I'm not sure what Alex means by that question. Yeah, what about um, machining for a top hat liner? Does it auto tool change? And we have more as well, if yeah. that's uh, maybe uh, an earlier question that yes. got into our feed. So, so the machine will not automatic tool change. It's a surfacer only, and depending on the material you're using, that brings up a point, you know, uh, I think Hal and, and uh, Chris alluded to CBN and PCD, and, and they're correct, you know, PCD is an aluminum only uh, insert. CBN can, use, can be used on either R, but as Chuck Lynch, I think, uh, iterated in his his uh, uh, subject that that the CBN, although you can use it on aluminum, probably isn't the optimal for surface finish. Excellent. This one for Joe uh, uh, from Jerry at Creason Racing. Are your bores honed and checked with a profilometer? And uh, they're looking for someone new in the St. Louis area. It looks like the expo was worth it already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there you go. Yes, we, we check every bore with a surface profilometer. And what, why is that important? Is I've, surface I've, finish is key. And even if you set up 
So different hardness blocks, different sleeve material, Darton sleeve versus an old 350 Chevy GM block will take a different setting on your honing uh, pressures, maybe even different stones to get the proper finish. And confirmed, the last question was from the previous machine, so that makes perfect sense. Here's one from Ken, um, and this may not be exactly what we're looking at at the moment. Why would I get a block back that the piston under deck is different from number two and number eight? The difference. So I think what he means there is his deck height is, in other words, one piston's further in the hole or further out of the deck. And Joe, you being a race engine builder, you can probably uh, comment on that probably better than I could. So the it can be a stack of tolerances. The piston manufactured itself not be correct uh, or be off by a couple thousandths the connecting rod. The crank throw could be different. The block could actually be machined not perfectly uh, equal end to end. Parallel end to end. Parallel end to end and side to side. Exactly. Uh, Joe is out there and he's he's not doing automotive machining, but he makes aluminum parts for radio controlled cars. Oh, really? Wow. And uh, cool. using 6061 and he just uh, wants to know about uh, using coolant on cutting tips to make the cutter last longer. Thought He thought that that is the norm. Uh, it, typically when you're machining parts on, on uh, just like our five axis uh, head machining or porting machine over there, that is a constant flow of coolant and, and you're trying to wash away the chips and keep the coolant or the, the cutter tip uh, uh, cool. But on surfacing as a rule, we don't use the coolant because it's just, it's a very messy process. And this machine will work both on cast iron and aluminum. And so what happens is, is if you try to, you end up doing some aluminum, you end up doing some cast iron, those kind of mix into the coolant and it becomes rancid much quicker. Oh, makes so, perfect so we try sense. to try to keep it a dry process. All right, we got time for some more questions, so send them in uh, before we move along. And we certainly appreciate everyone, and hopefully you're encouraging your friends to watch and share the link so we can get more people on. It's been amazing how many people have logged on today. Uh, talk a little bit about the machine, and and let's go back in terms of efficiency, uh, the simplicity and efficiency that uh, the technology has made happen. Like you can do so much more and create a better product. Okay. So the, the biggest thing I have found is this table. It's the setup time is so much quicker than, than the old methods. You can get it on there, get it clamped in there any possible way. Uh, their clamping system works extremely well, but if you got some odd shaped deal, you can get it clamped in there and then leveling it. The old machines you had to get it clamped level, which, which could be uh, you know, extremely time consuming, but that makes this job so much easier. If you're doing the exact same head again, or the same type of head, say like an LS head, come back to do another LS head, most of the time you put it in there, you clamp it up, and it's level. So um, it just makes, makes, uh, makes it a lot faster. Well, and that, I'm sure that's where a lot of the time is, right? Setting yes. up oh, the yes. unit. Yep. It's all set yeah. up time. It's set up time. And, set up time. and just to uh, emphasize that a little bit, what Joe's talking about is, is on the old style uh, clamp uh, uh, fixtures, you would have to put the level on the head and you're actually moving the fixture or bumping the cylinder head to do that. With this, you just clamp the cylinder head on there. We don't care if the cylinder head is level. All we want is all the rock out of the cylinder head. And then the table moves in two, in, in two planes. So we move both this way and end to end. So it makes it very quick to actually level a cylinder head and then cut. Uh, here's one that you'll probably like. Does Rottler have distributors in Europe? Yes, we do. I'm the domestic sales manager, so I'm not sure who or where they are, but yes, sir, we do. We have uh, distributors all th throughout the world, actually. Well, exactly. And uh, as we continue along, you got a couple more moments to fire off a question to us as we uh, try to learn a little bit more about the machine. Uh, we learned a lot about surfacing earlier and how vital it is. And you've already mentioned uh, keeping the tooling sharp. That's going to give us a great surface. Correct. And to talk about a question that a guy asked earlier about using coolant. Um, in this operation, typically we're just taking a real light cut. We're not machining parts. The, the guy was asking about machining parts and using flood coolant. Uh, this machine, typically, you just take a surface that, that is just a little bit irregular and just trying to make it smooth. You typically don't 
machine a, a, a tremendous amount off the park. Excellent. Yeah, so that's why you don't have coolant. There Great you point, go. Joe. Ed, Joe, thank you very much. More questions, put them in the chat section. We're going to get to them. Uh, no matter what, we're going to keep on trucking. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We're going to throw it to a video, and on the other side, we're going to have Doug Yates, so stick around. Hi, this is Keith from Total Steel Piston Rings. One of the common questions we get every day is which ring set's right for my engine? The best place to start is to give us a call. We're going to ask you a basic questions. What are you doing? Normally aspirated, circle track, drag race, streetcar, power adder, no power adder, and we'll narrow it down and get to where we need to be. But you ask, how do we get there to start with? Well, again, it's through those questions. We have to navigate all the different materials that rings are made out of. There's cast irons, there's ductile irons, there's hardened ductile irons, there's stainless steel, there's tool steel, there's even copper. All depends on the application. And that comes down to temperature and pressures. Different ring materials will handle different amounts of pressure. Once we've gotten you down that path and we think we've picked the right ring, what we need from you is the history of the engine. When we disassemble an engine that's been raced, we're always looking at all the parts. We're looking at bearing condition, valve spring pressures, how the rings are wearing, how the cylinders are wearing. But one of the things that you can monitor and look at is what is known as free gap. And that's the gap of the piston ring before you put it in the engine. Let me use this sample right here. This is one of our new gas ported top rings, which work really great by the way. It's already been file fitted. And one of the things you want to record in your build book is how much gap does that ring have before I install the engine. So simply take your caliper, check that amount of gap, in the case of this ring, it's about 500 thousandths. We've got a 500 thousandths free gap. Notice free gap. This is the gap prior to going in the engine. It's typical to see about 100 thousandths, maybe 80 thousandths of reduction in that gap. Once the engine's been run, the ring's been heat cycled, it's going to lose a little bit of that tension. Heat puts the tension in, heat takes the tension out. But if for some reason we disassemble that engine, and we're seeing 100 thousandths free gap where the tips have dropped down on the rings. They no longer line up evenly. We've overheated that ring. That ring material can't survive the environment that it's been exposed to. Now we have to ask the question, do we pick a tough enough material for the application or do we have a tuning problem? If we have a tuning problem, well, that's gonna show itself in other places. We're gonna see dark wrist pin bores, upper rod bearings that are knocked out of the engine, spark plugs that have got aluminum all over them, knocking head gaskets out of it, lifting ring lands. We see those things, again, when we disassemble the engine, it's kind of forensic. You know, we're doing the old CSI thing. It's going to tell us a, you know, a story if we're listening to it. So if we see those things, and we know we've done this to the ring, but we know we've got a tuning issue. But if everything comes out looking great, bearings look great, pistons look great, everything's happy, and yet we're still doing this to the ring, we simply don't have the right material. We haven't chosen something that will survive the temperature of your environment. This is free gap. It's an important thing to record, put it in your build book, keep a record of it, because it'll tell us a lot about the engine, how it's being tuned, and do we have the right ring. And if you ever have a question about that, please contact Total Seal. We're glad to answer any questions you may have. told us, don't start cars, we are not going to listen.